video, we're going to focus our attention on the Eastern Mediterranean and to the very center of Eurasia, to the region of Anatolia, and the story of the Ottoman Empire. By the early 13th century, Anatolia, which is modern-day Turkey, was controlled by two forces, the Byzantine Empire in the west and the Seljuk Turks in the east. The Seljuks had first established the first true Turkish state in Asia Minor, but would fall to the Mongols in 1243. The Mongols controlled Anatolia until the fall of the Ilkhanate in 1355. And in the wake of these nomadic incursions into Anatolia, in the wake of the Mongol invasions in the 13th and 14th centuries, three great empires coalesced. The Ottoman Empire in Anatolia, uh, the Levant, North Africa, and the southeastern part of Europe, the Safavid Empire in Persia, and the Mughal Empire in the Indian subcontinent. These three empires are often referred to as the gunpowder empires because much of their success depended on new technology, particularly gunpowder from China. Their control over gunpowder and artillery weren't the only reasons for the success of these three empires, but they were integral to military conquest and to the maintenance of these empires. So let's tell the story of one of the dominant empires from this era, the Ottoman Turks. Our story begins, as so many stories do in 11th and 12th century Eurasia, with the Mongols. The Mongols destroyed the control of both the Abbasid Empire and the Seljuk Turks over the Middle East. The fall of the Seljuks in Anatolia left a region in a bit of a political vacuum. Anatolia was divided, was fragmented into Beyliks, which were regions controlled by nobles called Beys, that were nominally under the control of the Mongols, first the empire itself, and then the Ilkhanate, which extended from Iran to eastern Anatolia. And as the Mongol control weakened, the Ilkhanate faced challenges from these Beys, from these fragmented regions in Anatolia. One of the Beys, Osman I, would found a group that went on to become known as the Ottoman Empire. The Ottomans would ultimately push the Mongols out of Asia Minor and then go on to conquer not only Anatolia, but the Levant, the eastern coast of the Mediterranean, the northern coast of Africa, and large parts of the coast of the Arabian Peninsula. The Ottoman Empire grew rapidly in the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries. They expanded control over Anatolia and into the Balkans throughout the 15th century. And by 1453, Mehmed II besieged and conquered the Byzantine capital of Constantinople, a huge blow to the Byzantine Empire and a coup for the Ottoman Turks. In the 200 years after the fall of Constantinople, the Ottomans extended their control over much of the Middle East and North Africa, seizing control of the Eastern Mediterranean, while land forces pushed into the southeastern part of Europe. By the 17th century, they had conquered the Middle East, the Red Sea and Persian Gulfs of the Arabian Peninsula, Northern Africa, and reached their peak by 17, sorry, excuse me, by 1699. Much of this expansion was built on military innovation. They adopted gunpowder artillery, particularly cannons and small arms, and that became the backbone of the Ottoman military, and particularly Ottoman military advantage. The result of the focus on conquest was an Ottoman society that was built in many ways on war and conquest and military advantage. So, for example, there was a tremendously strong military aristocracy. The original Turkish cal cavalry developed into an aristocracy with much control over land and resources, resulting in an uneasy division of labor 
uh, excuse me, an uneasy division of power, rather, between this military aristocracy, these nobles in the countryside, and the emperor called the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire in Constantinople. So what basically happened was that this military aristocracy, these nobles, gave Constantinople to the sultans, who were rather like kings in the Ottoman Empire, but with a religious connotation, as the capital, while the military aristocracy, including beys, pashas, and viziers, continued to grow and build up local power bases in the countryside. The sultans recognized these nobles as a threat, but also depended on them for the functioning of their empire, relied on them to maintain their empire. So the sultans attempted to balance the threat of this military aristocracy by creating something known as the Janissary Corps. And the Janissary Corps was essentially a, an infantry force, forcibly conscripted, so forcibly drafted, from the Christian population of the Balkans. These young men were not allowed to marry, were given very strict training and oversight, and expected to be extremely loyal to the Sultan. The result was a well-disciplined and loyal fighting force um, at the behest of the Sultan. So he would use this Janissary Corps in order to balance the threat from the countryside, to, to, to balance the threat from the nobles. The Janissaries quickly became the most potent force of the Ottoman military, and because they were part of the Sultan's household, were also heavily involved in court politics and court intrigue. This balance of power between the military aristocracy and the Sultan resulted in a golden age of Ottoman culture, particularly seen in Constantinople. After the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople, the capital underwent a period of building. The sultans restored the cities. They added mosques, like the Suleimania, converted the patriarchal church or cathedral of Constantinople into a mosque called the Hagia Sophia. They sponsored the construction of schools, hospitals, and rest houses. Thriving bazaars and marketplaces became places to trade international goods. Coffee houses provided a, a public forum for debate and discussion. People discussed politics. They discussed religion. It became an important part of Islamic culture. The artisans of Constantinople uh, established guilds and perfected manufacturing techniques. So the Ottoman court in Constantinople became the center of a thriving and elaborate urban civilization that was at its core Turkish, but was influenced by centuries of interaction between West and East. And the Ottoman Empire would continue for decades. They managed to maintain their vigor well into the 17th century but by the early 18th century, the Ottoman Empire was showing signs of decline, signs, signs of weakness. There are multiple reasons for this weakness, including isolation. Increasingly, the Ottoman court became isolated from the people. A noble known as a vizier was charged with leading the bureaucracy and often made the actual decisions for the sultan, so that later sultans became puppets of this central bureaucracy, puppets of the vizier. Other sultans would be dominated by powerful individuals within the Janissary Corps. So the sultans became more or less figureheads within the Ottoman Empire. The lack of clear paths of succession after the death of sultans meant that civil war and power struggles were relatively common. The size of the empire suggests that it was at times overextended, too large, and began, began a bit of retreat. The administrative structure that held up the Ottoman Empire, which had always depended on military expansion, began to deteriorate and weaken. 
Oppressive taxation resulted in protests. Economic upheavals challenged the authority of the Ottomans. For example, when the Portuguese managed to circumnavigate Africa, when they managed to get around the Cape of Good Hope at the southern tip of Africa, gaining access to the Indian Ocean and trade with India and China, they were able to circumvent the Ottomans' position as the middlemen of Europe. The Ottomans had dominated the Silk Road and trade between Europe and Asia because of their position in the middle. There was no way, prior to the 15th century, of connecting, of Europe trading with, Af uh, with Asia or Asia trading with Europe without going through the Ottomans. And the Ottomans used this position to their advantage, making a tremendous amount of wealth in the process. But when Portugal established a new route to China, and when Spain, a few decades later, established connections with the Americas and marked the beginning of the Colombian exchange in the Atlantic world, this would displace the Ottoman Empire as the middlemen, as the center of the world and the center of economy. The influx of bullion from the New World destabilized the Ottoman economy, resulting in inflation. And finally, um, the, there were changes in the 18th and 19th century in military technology, which the Janissary Corps were resistant to. And this caused the Ottoman Empire to fall behind Western nations. As Western nations industrialized and as their armies industrialized, the Ottoman armies remained tied to traditional, uh, to their traditional ways of doing things. This technological and cultural conservatism continued to cause Ottoman decline, continued to cause them to disregard several important changes coming out of Europe, including industrialization, and resulted in the Ottomans becoming progressively weaker in the 18th and 19th centuries, at least compared to their Western rivals. The Ottoman Empire, as a result, would be divided amongst the Allied powers after World War I, and that served to change the dynamic of the Middle East in the 20th century. But its important position in the center of Eurasia for most of the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries made them a potent force in world history and one in which East and West combined. So it's worth studying and thinking about the role of not just the Ottoman Empire, but the gunpowder empires in the story of world history. Thank you.